Okay. All right, Adam, I think you're ready to go on that. So there's the intro slide. Can you just see whether this does, does that move the slide? Nope. No, that's not moving the slide. No. Um, sorry about this, folks. Technology always catches me out. <laughs> that's not moving the slide at all. No. Let me just try that. Uh, that. Yes. We're on the map now. Uh, yeah. I want to go back, though. So okay. I'll, uh... oh, okay. There we go. I think I've got it. Okay. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so it's called a seasonal guide to bird watching in South Devon, area of Southern Natural Beauty in the autumn. Mm, bird watchers' autumns start really, really early. My autumn usually starts in July, or mythologically, you start to see a change. Different sorts of birds are in the air moving around. And then the autumn can go on right through to the middle of November. Um, and I like it as a season. It's a really exciting season. You can smell it in the air and all the different birds that you see are uh, they're going somewhere or uh, or they're sort of really the, the very few resident birds that we've got that really don't move anywhere. Um, so it's a really exciting uh, part of the year. Um, so to talk about uh, the A would be itself. Uh, that's this area here uh, that we can see in pale green. Um, it was designated in 1960. And as Nikki says, we've been celebrating all year our 60th anniversary. Um, I've been celebrating as well because I'm 60 this, this year. So um, it's been a good year. Um, so the AUMB itself, it covers 340 square kilometres of land, about 75 kilometres of coastline. We've got five estuaries um, and uh, a heritage coast. We've got special areas of conservation. There are six of them. There are 18 sites of special scientific interest, two national nature reserves, 58 scheduled ancient monuments and four protected wrecks just in, in and the inshore waters so uh, these designations tell you something it says it's a really special place and it's not only a special place for for people it's a really special place for wildlife as well um just to say something about those uh, protected areas only 5.8 percent are statutory uh nature reserve sites so uh national nature reserves we've got two We've got marine protected areas, marine conservation zones. We've got special areas of conservation, just specifically for the greater horseshoe bat. And that covers about 5.8% of, uh, of the protected landscape. But we've also got lots of non-statutory sites, county wildlife sites, um, Devon Wildlife Trust and Devon Birds have got reserves. Uh, and we've got the rigs, the regionally important geological sites because there are lots of birds that breed on our cliff sites as well. And we've also got strategic nature areas. So those strategic nature areas have been, uh, they're, not, they're not statutory, but they're, they're identified in brown on the map there. And that I'm gonna be saying a little bit more later about our nature recovery plans, because um, it's really important that we have a, a strategic approach to looking after nature across our patch. And, um, that the idea is, is to have bigger, better and more connected areas of countryside so that uh, birds, plants, animals and insects could actually move naturally across our landscape and essentially start to move from this sort of uh, very squid, well, squoze, is that the right word? squidged uh, all of the rare species have been pushed right to the edge of the coastline and um, We've got to do something about that. We really, really have. Um, but really, it, we've got a fantastic landscape. It's a great place to go bird watching in, and um, you know, you will see you will see birds when you're outside in the A and B. There's no doubt about it. But I'm here to try and help you to see uh, to see more species. 
just at the moment, there might be 150 different sorts of birds within the AOMB. Um, and that's because it's about this time of year that there are still, you can still search and find some of the summer birds. You could find some of the wintering birds, but also they're joined by the visitors, the migrating birds that are stopping off and feeding up before they head on, on with their epic journeys to where they're going to spend the, the winter. Or, you know, some, most are going south, there's still some coming north. So it's a really good time of year for bird watching. And uh, autumn, as I said, uh, I'm always very excited by it. Um, one of the best ways to uh, to improve your bird watching is to be able to read the landscape, the read the habitats. Um, these are our main habitats within the AOMB: uh, woodland, meadows, grassland, uh, the coastal the coastal strip, uh, lots of farmland. Seventy four percent of the AOMB's farmland. Uh, we've got our freshwater lagoons and marshes and reed beds, uh, the sheltered estuaries. Uh, we've got rocky foreshore, which is a very specific habitat, and we've got shingle and sand dunes and mud flats. And the different birds will use these habitats. And uh, not, it's not quite the same to a certain extent in the autumn because anything can turn up anywhere. That's what I love about it. These uh, migrating birds that are essentially stopping off to feed before they move off for their, 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 their sort of winter quarters. So um, I suppose that. One of the questions to think about is uh, why do birds migrate at all? Why don't they just stay here? Well, they're essentially moving from areas of low or decreasing resources to areas of higher or increased resources, which is essentially uh, food at this time of year. They're, uh, they're moving to, uh, to, to look for different food sources and many insectivorous birds. So the wonderful swallows that come and stay with us, um, that most of them have already gone um, and uh, you know the swallows now are, are heading their way south uh, they they winter in South Africa uh, south of the Sahara and uh, some actually uh, winter in the Indian subcontinent um, they travel through western France across the Par Pyrenees down through Spain uh, onto the into the Sahara Cross the Sahara to their uh, their wintering grounds, and while they're there, um, I just love the thought of uh, swallows flying between giraffes' legs at the moment. Uh, just considering that uh, you know that they they've left relatively recently. Um, so, as I said, it, it, it's really about insect populations, but it's also about day length and less hearth weather conditions, and they're uh, reduced risk from predators. And the, um, so there's some really good reasons for them to take that incredibly risky long journey. Uh, they're latitudinal migration, mi migrants, so they're moving from the north to the south and vice versa. And, and essentially most birds of the northern uh, temperate and subarctic zones, uh, they, they, they fly south, um, uh, uh, well, the, or they come back here to nest and feed during the summer, and they and they go back south in in the winter. Um, so, just wanted to say uh, a bit about the different birds that we have. Uh, so, of those hundred and fifty birds, the smallest you'll see is the goldcrest. Um, it's a great little bird, the goldcrest, and uh, the largest bird that you'll see in the AMB is the mute swan. Uh, they're the two, that's the smallest and the largest bird uh, within, within the UK. And um, it's just about this time of year that we start to see numbers of these birds increase. You'll start to see and hear gold crests all over the place. You might start seeing larger numbers of blackbirds and song thrushes and robins and, and chaffinches. Uh, and these are all birds that you might think just live here all year round. So the blackbird in your garden is the one that's there in the summer. Probably not the case. These are continental birds that are replacing our birds. Our birds have probably just shifted further south and the birds that are replacing them have come from the continent. And uh, that's why we're seeing these really big increased numbers of uh, thrushes and robins and goldcrests 
Uh, and it's about this time of year that it, that it really happens. So the peak uh, migration time is mid-October. So we're right in the most exciting time of year for, for this sort of activity. And uh, just an example, pied wagtails, uh, birds that you, you, know, you often see uh, around the streets of Kingsbridge in the summertime, and you might see them out in some of the agricultural land. They've got into really big flocks and that they gather together and, uh, and, and they migrate and they go to just towards uh, the sort of slightly warmer bits of, uh, of Europe. Believe it or not, last week there were just a thousand pied wagtails in the reed bed at Slapton on, on one morning. A thousand left those reed beds. They spent the night there. They were moving in, in really huge numbers. Uh, very exciting stuff, to be honest. So this wonderful planet of ours and this amazing journey that, that birds take. So while short distance migrations probably developed from a fairly just a simple searching for food, um, the origins of long, long migrations is, is a lot more complex. And um, as birds evolved over hundreds and thousands of years, um, the, this migration instinct is uh, is in their genes, um, and uh, the, they just seem to know what to do. Even young swallows, they don't follow their parents. They're, the adult swallows left ages ago. It's the last few youngsters now that that might be the third broods. Uh, they've fledged. They're just getting used to flying. They're still going to go to South Africa because it's actually hardwired into them and uh, and how to do it so um so just to give you an idea of uh different birds and the way they move around so swallows when they migrate they fly uh, pretty well under a thousand feet and some of that is based on they, they're eating on the way so if you've got a beautiful clear uh, warm day in the autumn swallows will fly at about a thousand feet and they'll they'll still catch uh, insects as they're flying and this is the sort of view uh, down at Torcross that a swallow would get as it's migrating from uh, perhaps the north of England and heading to South Africa um, and then this is Torcross if you're a warbler uh, migrating and they tend to migrate at about 5,000 feet and uh, a lot of the warblers are night migrants uh, they orientate by the stars so on clear nights there'll be huge movements of birds across the UK especially across us here in South Devon and uh, radars have picked these up as well huge little traces huge numbers of little traces of birds that are, that are heading south out across the channel and then wading birds, these are birds on the whole that actually nest in, uh, in Scandinavia or in Iceland or Greenland, and they're passing over, uh, they're stopping off at wetlands, they might have dropped down to, uh, to South Hewish Marsh to feed for a few days. But those birds that are going over the top of us, um, they're flying at 16 and a half thousand feet, and that's the sort of view that they'd be getting. Um, some of these birds are day migrants and once again some some are night migrants um, and we find out more and more about migration um, through something called NOCMIG, nocturnal migration and it's where uh, ornithologists are putting um, sound recorders out and listening to tiny calls that, that can be recorded in the middle of the night and we're starting to realize that there's, there's some really unusual birds flying right over the top of us that we never really realised were there. But then the really bigger birds, whether that be a geese migrating or, uh, well, you know, there's a whole range of birds of prey that, that, that move and migrate, uh, and they're flying at 25,000 feet. They're really getting this incredible view of, uh, of South Devon if they're flying during the day. So there are really exciting birds at this time of year. We get transatlantic vagrants. These are birds that uh, have been completely blown off course. They've got caught up in the, the jet stream and they've been 
flown from uh, the Americas. Uh, the little insect photograph there is called a red-eyed vireo. It's quite a common bird in America, um, but just last, just week before last, actually, there was a red-eyed vireo um, down at Stairhole Point, um, Stair or Hull Cove, just near uh, Bolt Head and Sulcum there. And it's just one individual who was seen for two days. Uh, and it's very, we don't really know whether these birds continue their latitu latitudinal north-south migration. Um, the red-eyed vireo breeds in North America and Canada and winters in South America. But now it's over here. Perhaps it's just going to pick those, uh, those ma magnetic fields up again and, uh, and move. And because we're an island, we get, uh, we get these blow-ins, these rare, rare birds come to us. So uh, we get Siberian vagrants as well. And only last week, there was a yellow-browed warbler that's come from Siberia uh, and Russia. Um, seen locally and this is get, gets birds, gets the sort of really keen bird which is very very excited and they uh, they rush around uh, wanting to see these species but you know it's also uh, the science of migration is helping us conserve them so um, the cuckoo project has been absolutely amazing um, we've been uh, using new technology, uh, radio tagging uh, cuckoos on their migrations. And um, we're starting to find out uh, where they go and which migration routes they use. So uh, the project started in 2012. We're finding out a bit about how long cuckoos live. We get a bit more of an understanding of uh, the different routes that, that cuckoos take to get to the Congo, because that's where they spend the winter, um, and in and in East Africa actually. Um, and so, a bird like the cuckoo that is it's so charismatic that that that, that noise their call is incredible, but we've lost over half of our cuckoos uh, in the last twenty years. So when I was a lad and first started bird watching, I would see and hear cuckoos from through May and June, really exciting herald of spring. And what a fantastic uh, lifestyle they have, uh, laying their eggs in other birds' nests that then bring them up. And uh, like I say, the bird watcher's calendar, uh, a cuckoo's a bit of a classic, really. Uh, they arrive, if you're lucky, uh, early May, possibly the end of April. And then the adults, they've, uh, they've, they've paired, they've laid their eggs in a meadow pipit's nest or uh, a hedge sparrow's nest, or uh, you know, they've got quite a few uh, target species that they would lay this, their single egg in. The reed warbler is, is quite common for us. And, uh, and then they're off again. So the cuckoos can, uh, can start, the adults can start to leave us in July. Uh, that's it. They, they, they only spend a tiny part of their year with us. So the uh, the cuckoo project. Um, I'll just say a bit more about that. Really, um, you can go online. You can uh, you can find out where the, where these radio tag cuckoos are uh, are travelling to. Uh, it's quite nice. They give them uh, they give them names. Um, who's this one then? Does it say? AJ, this is AJ, and um, you know he's lived for a good few years, and uh, they pick up on the tags, and we can see now he's uh, AJ looks like he, he's safely for the winter in those uh, those tropical forests of the Congo, and uh, he'll be finding lots to eat. He'll be having good long day length because uh, you know pretty close to the equator there and uh, is less likely to be predated because he's in the depths of the forest. Um, and, and science is starting to help us understand uh, the actual routes that they take. And it does appear that some of the routes that they take uh, have, um, have more threats than others. And it's perhaps those cuckoos that, that haven't survived. So uh, just getting back to, uh, to that migration theme again, um, this is a, a, an image that I took from Twitter um, just, uh, just, just earlier in the month, uh, 4th of October. Um, and 
people are really getting interested in this thing called VISMIG, uh, visible migration. And uh, just look at some of those statistics, just from somebody who's been uh, bird watching uh, just for oh, just for under an hour uh, at Slapton Bridge. Uh, all going south, 550 meadow pipits. That's a, that's a really big number of birds. Some great wagtails, swallows, house martins, 70 goldfinch, siskin, 340 linnets. Um, amazing movement of birds. And this, this is happening every day throughout October. So I'll just say a little bit more about some of those birds that are, that are mentioned there. And um, here we go. So <laughs> this, uh, it's a common bird really of the moorland and the heathland and rough grassland. Uh, there's a few breeders in South Devon, but the vast majority of these breeders uh, are up in the uplands. That's where they breed. And uh, about this time of year, they start an altitudinal migration to move from the high ground to the low ground. And uh, small flocks can be found gathering on farmland and on salt marshes. And um, they've got a distinctive uh, sort of twittery call. Is what they say. Um, and like, like, like I showed on the previous slide, just in an hour's watching, there were 550 flying over Slapton there. Well, there are, there are two million pairs of, uh, of meadow pipit in the UK. Uh, the vast majority, uh, Scotland and the Pennines, there's a lot in Wales, and they're all moving towards this low ground. And some of them do leave, leave the country altogether. And, and, and travel to, uh, to mainland Europe. But then again, quite a lot of meadow pipits have moved here from Scandinavia as well. And um, as you can see, it's not a particularly inspiring bird. It's the classic LBJ, little brown job. And lots of people ask me, oh, I've seen a little brown bird. And the key is to actually find out where they saw it. Uh, if it was in your garden, very likely to be a hedge sparrow. Uh, if it was in farmland, very likely to be a meadow pipit. So uh, a bird that's uh, that's a bit more charming, uh, and pardon the pun there, because the collective noun for a goldfinch is a charm of goldfinches. They're really striking. They've got these red crowns. They've got a golden back, the bright yellow wings. And they're probably one of our prettiest birds, uh, to be honest, in the UK. Um, and most people think that they're uh, they're just resident birds, but huge numbers of our goldfinches leave our shores and go to southern Europe. They start to gather in big numbers. Uh, you see flocks of 20 and 30 around and they're hanging on at the moment, feeding up so that they can make this journey uh, to, to mainland Europe. And then once again, a lot of our goldfinches are replaced by birds from from Scandinavia. Um, lovely to see mixed flocks of, uh, of linnets and goldfinches. Um, so uh, there's a lovely goldfinch for you. Um, and the linnet, it's not a brilliant photo of a linnet, but uh, they've got quite nice rosy chests. Uh, once again, a really twittery sort of bird, very undulating flight. And uh, they actually, you know, they, they stay the winter with us. Uh, huge numbers. Uh, uh, you might see a flock of 200 uh, down at East Saw. Um, but once again, it's it's always the same old sad tale that the the, the numbers have dropped substantially uh, over the last few decades, and um, you know the, the UK population has probably halved since 1970, and um, this is what we're all working towards is to turn their fortunes around so that we can have a bigger, better, and more joined up uh, countryside. And uh, we can look closely at uh, the habitats that these species need and the different farming practices that are going to uh, help the fortunes of these sorts of birds. Um, it's the same with all of the farmland birds, really. Um, this is a skylark. Uh, as you know, you spend May and June uh, in our countryside, you'll hear skylarks. Um, but at this time of year, the numbers really start to build up. 
and you can see as many as 200 skylarks in a single flock because once again Altitudinal migration means that these birds are moving from uh, the uplands to come and spend the winter at a lower elevation. So I'd like to just say a little bit about uh, the partial migrants. Um, this is a male black cap. Uh, traditionally, it's always been a, uh, I say, a, uh, a summer visitor. Um, it's known as the Northern Nightingale. It's got a beautiful song. Uh, it's a bird that when I first started bird watching, I, uh, I would expect to see them March and April, and then they'd, they'd be all gone in September. Um, but through climate change and through, once again, scientific observations and tracking, we've started to find that uh, black caps are starting to spend the whole year with us. Um, even though the British population migrates south, it appears that uh, birds from Germany and Eastern Europe come and spend the, uh, the winter with us. So we're getting a lot more records and reports of black caps in people's gardens. They particularly like feeding on Mahonia. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, common garden plants that, that, we, uh, that we have that attract these birds. And so um, I, th I think we started to see the black cap as a as a partial migrant and um, some of our own black cats are possibly going to start overwintering with us. This is because we've got milder conditions, there's lots of food for them and they're, they're sort of evolving to not the whole population not taking that massive risk of, uh, of, of flying to Africa. So um, a lot of the a lot of the warblers uh, that come to this country, the summer visitors, they uh, they do that sort of north south movement, um, and it's at this time of year that the willow warblers they've started to uh, to move off, um, but the juvenile willow warblers are much they've got really clean plumage, their 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 yellow tinges are warmer, um, uh, they're, they're, they're easier to separate from the chiff chaff at this time of year, the youngsters, because they're so bright. Um, and uh, it's a relatively common bird. Uh, and it's at this time of year, you might see them out of the usual habitat. It's a bird, it's a woodland bird, essentially. But you might see it on a wall at start points, or you might find it, um, you know, close to the estuaries. They sort of, because they're moving they're, and they're not there for the breeding habitat, uh, you could see them almost anywhere. Here's a great favourite, the grey wagtail. Um, as you can see, it's got that sulphur yellow uh, rump and underparts there. Um, uh, often people think they've seen a yellow wagtail, but you know the grey wagtails are uh, far more common, much more associated to uh, rivers and streams. But at this time of year, all of the birds that have been breeding up on Dartmoor are down in the AOMB and we're getting, you, you, you hear them before you see them. Uh, they've proportionately got the longest tail of any bird in the UK. Um, and it's, it, it's a pleasure to see them and hear them. And uh, we've got really good numbers of them at the moment on, on, on many sites uh, across our patch. Well, I don't seem to be able to do a talk about birds in, uh, in the South Devon area of outstanding natural beauty without mentioning the Searle bunting. Um, so there was a time there were only 100 pairs of Searle buntings in, in the whole of the UK, and they were pretty well uh, only could be found in, in South Devon. And uh, that population has, uh, well, it's increased tenfold. Uh, there's well over, well over, I would say 1500 pairs of seal buntings now. A lot of that has been down to agricultural practice changes. Um, and uh, it's a real success story, not just for the RSPB, but for the landowners themselves. Um, you know, a lot of farmers there, um, that, that they are responsible not only for providing food and providing lots of access to the countryside, 
but they also do this wonderful job with nature conservation as well. And uh, the government through DEFRA are looking at new ways of funding them so that we could actually uh, have a more targeted approach for uh, recovering the nature that we've lost. And this, this charismatic, almost iconic bird, the Searle Bunty, is, uh, is, is really here to stay now. Um, I saw my first Searle Bunty in, in, the, uh, in the 1970s down at Prawl Point. Um, it's, it was the last stronghold for this bird. And uh, those changes in practices have made it so I can hardly go anywhere in the AOMB without hearing the rattle of the Searle Bunty. Really great birds. Uh, although uh, the female, she is a bit dowdy. Um, and uh, it's at this time of year that they tend to gather in small flocks and, and, and have traditional wintering areas. Uh, there are quite a few projects out there where local people feed them. Uh, the RSPB work closely with communities to be able to uh, give them a, a, a helping hand, really. They really need to be feeding on uh, on left stubbles and uh, in the spring they need good broad margins where they can get insects to feed their young. And uh, actually knowing about the needs of the seal bunting has, uh, has really given us a chance to, to conserve it. Um, and we're still, you know, Devon's the only place that you can really uh, see seal bunting. There was a reintroduction programme of Sir Bunting's being moved from, uh, from South Devon and introduced uh, into the Roseland Peninsula in Cornwall. And uh, they do seem to be naturalising there. An interesting reintroduction programme. Well, a completely different bird is the Red Wing, and they've just started to arrive in numbers. And when I say numbers, I mean big numbers. Uh, just uh, in Wiltshire, uh, Last week, somebody observed uh, 34,000 red wings flying west. Uh, I, hear them every, I hear them every evening if I go outside in my garden, the thin seep, seep call of the, uh, of the red wing. Uh, and I'm starting to see small flocks of them as well during the day. And these are birds that are relying on hawthorn berries or bryony berries, uh, 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 I suppose rose hips, um, and feeding on feeding in the agricultural land, really striking thrushes. Uh, they don't breed here in the UK. They've got that lovely uh, eye stripe above the eye that makes them look a bit cross, actually. Um, but the uh, the red wings are uh, uh, they're piling in, really thousands and thousands of them to spend the winter with us. Um, a slightly larger thrush that comes to see us uh, in the winter time is the field fair. Um, they're onomatopoeic, they say their own name, well it hardly sounds like field fair, but some people say it sounds like field fair, um, and their, their numbers will build as the weather conditions get harsher, uh, they're sort of spread quite evenly over the UK, huge numbers arriving on the east coast, places like Spurn and North Norfolk, and they're gradually filtering through the UK, the, the UK and they will as, as the weather harshens, uh, we'll get more and more of these birds with us. Um, here's a bird, uh, a fantastic bird, the jay. Uh, I have to admit, it's one of my favourite uh, species. Um, they do this incredible job of uh, moving acorns around. They've got quite a big crop. They can fit about six or eight acorns uh, into this crop and they'll fly off from the woodlands and they'll find areas where they can bury these uh, acorns, uh, of which many actually do grow into trees. Uh, and so essentially they're doing a fantastic job for us in terms of uh, helping the, uh, uh, the, the, the tree planting needs that we have. Uh, they're, they're, they're really loud, raucous birds. Um, and some people think they're just resident birds that don't migrate, but they're eruption species. So um, we get huge invasions of thousands of these birds uh, in some years. And it looks like it's an eruption year, uh, which pretty well indicates that uh, the acorn crop in, in mainland Europe has failed. 
and uh, these birds are, uh, are all gathering, moving west, and they're coming over in massive numbers. Uh, you very rarely see more than five or six jays ever together. So just last week, there was 150 flying west over Dawlish Warren. Um, unprecedented numbers and uh, this constant uh, you know, eruption behaviour means that large, you're going to see large numbers of jays this year in, uh, in your gardens and across the whole patch. Uh, there was one scene from the Salonian as well, and the bird watchers on the Isles of Scilly were getting really excited that they might see it because you don't, you don't get jays on Scilly. Um, and so that's the end of the line, really. But we are going to see a lot, a lot of these birds around, and they're just fabulous birds. Uh, Garrulus glandulus is their Latin name. Uh, Garrulus because they can almost sound like they talk, and glandulus is because they have like a... Um, uh, an acetic acid sort of uh, repellent substance just on their rump and they'll oil themselves with this oil and they'll uh, be able to raid ants nests without getting covered in in the ants uh, poisons. Fabulous birds. So that's the J eruption. Um, I like to talk about seabirds a bit now. Uh, this is what we're seeing today off Berry Head, uh, some really quite impressive numbers. Um, you get some birders that call themselves sea watchers. It's a labour of love. I've done a fair bit of sea watching in my time, where you sit on an, under an umbrella on a seat with a tripod and a telescope, and you look out to sea and you count seabirds. And you usually have to do it in pretty wild conditions. Um, and uh, just alone today, let's just go through some of the birds that have been seen between 7.30 this morning and 2.15. That's a, that's, a, that's a long day to be sea watching right off the end of Berry Head. Uh, Velvet Scoter, that's quite, a, that's quite a rare bird. Pomerin Skewer, I'll tell you a bit more about these birds as I go along. Manx Shearwaters, uh, a puffin today, which is, is quite a late, a late bird for a puffin. Quite a lot of orcs, that's razorbills and guillemots. Uh, lots of Mediterranean gulls. These birds could have travelled here from as far away as Poland. Uh, it's quite nice to actually see some interesting cetaceans as well. Harbour porpoise, common dolphins and Atlantic bluefin tuna. Uh, that's, that's quite a haul for uh, a day's sea watching. Um, but uh, you've got to be pretty wrapped up. You've probably all noticed that the weather's changed a bit. Uh, there was quite a lot of squally rain today, pushing these birds slightly closer to our coasts from, from uh, the mid channel as these birds head out over towards the Bay of Biscay or to go and spend the, uh, the winter in the Atlantic. Quite something. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of those birds if you're not familiar with them. Uh, this is the Manx Shearwater and whenever you see watching you'll somebody will shout out Manxy! And the Manxy, well, 75% of the whole world population of Manx Shearwaters breeds in the UK. It, might to, it migrates to South America and back. Um, and uh, I think birds have been known to live a very long time. And uh, one bird has been known to have flown 8 million kilometres in its lifetime. That's like flying to the moon and back. 10 times. Uh, they call shearwaters because they hardly flap their wings. Um, they just glide over the surface of the water. They eat squid uh, and they nest in holes on islands. Uh, just fascinating birds, really, really fascinating birds. And I'd say one's been seen today uh, just off Berry Head. Um, but this is the real star. Uh, this is the Balearic shearwater. Uh, it's a bird that uh, it is very, very rare. Uh, it's, it's declined about 90% in three generations. Uh, they reckon there's a fair chance that it might be extinct in 60 years' time. Um, it's a very small population that, that breed uh, on, on the Balearic Islands. But we see really quite large numbers of them here on the coast just off South Devon. It's a, a real speciality bird for us. And uh, I've seen quite a few this year. There's been some really big numbers. I think there was a 380 
Balearic Day uh, earlier in the sea watching season. Uh, but I, I couldn't not mention it because uh, it's so rare and it's so special for us to have it passing just off our coasts uh, in the autumn. Well, I thought I'd mention uh, some of the other birds that, that come and spend the winter with us, the divers. Uh, this is a, a winter plumage red-throated diver, uh, but we do see black-throated diver and great northern diver. But once again, very low numbers at the moment. And it's not until the really harsh midwinter comes that we see lots of divers and grebes off our coast. Uh, but the waters uh, are rich. Uh, the marine conservation zones and, uh, and, and some of these areas of seagrass hold huge amounts of food for these birds to, uh, to migrate to and to spend the winter with us. Um, same as for the sea ducks, these are common scoters. Quite large numbers of flocks of common scoters starting to build just off our coasts. And uh, once again, they'll dive down and, and feed on mollusks. And uh, they've spent that they've been breeding in Iceland and then they're coming to, uh, to spend the winter with us. The sea swallows. Uh, I, I can't really talk about the autumn without talking about the sea swallows. Um, common in Arctic terns. Uh, so you can you can see there. Um, the Arctic tern, much longer tail streamers. It's got a shorter bill that doesn't have a dark tip to it. Much more agile, really. The wings are slightly nar narrower. Um, and the Arctic terns just generally seem a bit more delicate and, and compact, but very similar looking birds. And you've really got to get your eye in to, uh, to be able to see the difference between a common tern and an Arctic tern. Um, but it's the Arctics that I really want to talk about. Um, they're just uh, amazing species, really. They see more daylight than any other animal. Um, they're the furthest, longest migration of any, any animal in the, uh, in the animal kingdom. Um, they travel from pole to pole every single year. Uh, and essentially, that's uh, they travel 90,000 kilometres uh, a year. That's 55,000 miles every single year. And they're chasing the sun, essentially. So they've got the midnight sun in the, uh, in the Arctic and the midnight sun in the subarctic. Uh, and just, uh, well, they're just such special birds. They really are. They don't breed with us. Uh, they just pass through. But it's definitely a bird that uh, I'm always keen to look for in the spring and the autumn. Uh, but if you've got the sea swallows, if the terns are around, that's when you'll see the skewers. Uh, this is a pomerang skewer. Uh, as you can see, it's as big as a herring gull. Um, this is a youngster, uh, a very tiny tail projection there with these light flashes in the wings. But they've got a they've got a rather unpleasant way about them. Uh, the way they feed is they chase terns until the terns are sick or they, or, or, or to stop them being harassed, uh, the, the, the terns might regurgitate their food and the, the skewers will come down and take them and off they go. They're parasitic birds. And uh, that palm skewer that was seen today at Berry Head was undoubtedly following lots of those other seabirds to be able to make them regurgitate their food and, and, and so they, they can survive. Um, it doesn't breed in the UK, uh, but we do see small numbers of these birds uh, in the autumn uh, off our coastlines. Well, moving away from the sea and just into the estuaries, uh, we've, got, we've got some great little birds. Um, there's the, the common sandpiper. It's a small wading bird, brown upper side, white below. Uh, it, it bobs a lot. It teeters. It's got a very distinctive flight with stiff bowed wings. And uh, it usually gives itself away with its pee wee 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 call. And uh, these birds do winter with us uh, a lot, leave the UK shores, but because of our uh, slightly warmer climate, um, we see them on our estuaries. And uh, it's for, for me as a northern lad, it's uh, it's great to see these birds in the winter 
uh, down at uh, at Kingsbridge or, uh, or or over at the Urn Estuary. Um, but there's a whole range of wading birds that uh, that do come and spend the, the, the winter with us. Uh, the green shank, once again, it's uh, it, it's an unusual bird. Really, it breeds high up in uh, coniferous forests or on uh, or on the the high moorland of Scandinavia. And uh, the birds come down here, and, and and some of them do spend the whole winter with us. Uh, really great birds. Um, Similar to the red shank, but with green legs. Uh, it's, 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 it is what it says on the tin. So the green shank is a, a bit of a treat to see down here in South Devon. And there's a whole range of other wading birds that you might bump into. Um, I, I, I sort of I have to mention the uh, the bar-tailed godwit. Uh, we see those uh, passing overhead. Um, and that they, they win the prize for uh, the, the the longest single non-stop uh, flight. Um, believe it or not, a bar-tailed godwit will fly seven thousand miles without landing in one go. Um, just an unbelievable feat of engineering for a bird like this. Whenever I see bar-tailed godwits, uh, somewhere like South Hewish Marsh, perhaps you'll see some barwits as I call them. And um, I think to myself, has it just, has it just arrived? Has it just flown 7,000 miles to get here? That's why it looks so hungry. And then a bar, a bar tail god, it might spend uh, up to a week with us feeding up before it heads off on some, uh, some other colossal journey. A um, couple more waders for me to just chat through with you. Uh, they don't breed here. Uh, but the turnstone, uh, the bird on the left with the bright orange waxy legs, is the bird that you'll see running around Brixham Fish Harbour, or you'll actually see it on our, um, uh, on our rocky shores. Uh, turnstones, great little birds. Uh, they breed in Canada and Greenland. Uh, they don't breed in the UK, uh, but they, uh, they spend their time creeping and fluttering over rocks, picking food from, uh, from the stones that they turn over. They must have incredibly strong, uh, strong necks and, and approaches for moving stones. Uh, they've got a really broad diet. Uh, they'll eat almost anything they can find. And um, they can turn a stone over their own size. You know, and it's a bird the size, you know, it's a bit, bit bigger than a blackbird, but uh, they, uh, they're, they're full of great antics. The bird to the right is the purple sandpiper. And we're just starting to see a few more of those now. Uh, they winter uh, on any, almost any rocky coast in the UK, but I'm glad to say our numbers seem to be doing, uh, doing quite well. Uh, other birds, we've got a lapwing on the left and the snipe on the right. So these, uh, they, you might have noticed from these wading birds, they've all got very different length bills. Uh, like the curly with a great big long curved bill and the snipe there with its very long straight bill. These are so they can uh, puncture the, uh, the earth or the mud and reach down to that incredible food source that uh, nothing else is really taking advantage of. So lots of wading birds coming to spend the winter with us. Same goes for uh, uh, the species of wildfowl as well. We've got great wildfowl across the, uh, the AOMB. Uh, it's one of my favourites here is the widgeon. Um, once again, a bird that breeds in Scandinavia, Russia and Iceland. And they come here in really large numbers, uh, make a lovely whistling call. Uh, the females aren't quite as striking as the, as the drakes, but uh, it's, a, it's a bird we see on, on many of our sort of marshland areas. But I think it's, uh, I've talked a lot about habitats, but it's also important to keep your eye on the skies. And uh, we're really lucky down here to have the, uh, the birds of prey that either spend the winter with us or, or pass overhead. So I think as you're looking at this slide, the top left hand side is the common buzzard, probably the commonest bird of prey in South Devon. Um, really good buzzard numbers, but uh, you know, We've had a few records of honey buzzard this year, Scandinavian birds that look very similar to, to the common buzzard. But the common buzzard is a, a very variable species. 
it's uh, you get some very dark individuals, you get some very pale individuals, but they are all individuals. You can actually get to know your local buzzards to a certain extent just by noticing the, uh, the, the, the where the patterning is on, on the birds. Uh, birds that they saw on V-shaped wings, uh, really quite an easy bird to, to identify. And they're big as well, sat on top of our, our telegraph poles or, uh, or, or, or soaring in the air. Good numbers breeding in woodlands. So the bird to the right that you can see is actually hovering. That's the kestrel and or the wind hover. And uh, we have good numbers of kestrels, uh, quite a lot of uh, cliff nesting uh, pairs. Uh, and uh, they, they, they can just mesmerise you the way that they can hover in the sky, not moving their heads a millimetre before they actually focus in on a small rodent and then they'll, they'll sort of dive down and, and catch them and ca carry them away and eat them. Top right hand corner uh, with that diamond tail, that's the raven. Uh, we have great numbers of ravens, uh, probably one of our earliest breeders. Uh, ravens can be sat on eggs in February um, uh, with their very distinctive croaking call. They, they cronk, 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 cronk is, is the way they call. And um, we, we do really well for, for ravens. And at this time of year, you might see family parties. So you'll see small flocks of, uh, of ravens. Just below the raven there, the, the, the bird with the forked tail, is the red kite. Um, it's a bird that I always hope one day will colonise South Devon. There's been reintroduction schemes all over the UK, but not, not on our patch. Uh, but we do see good numbers of, uh, of red kites throughout the year. Just uh, in the spring, there's a bit of a pulse of movement. And in the winter, uh, about this time of year, there's a, there's a good chance you might see a kite about. It's, it's nothing that would be too surprising. Uh, bottom right is the sparrowhawk. Um, you've got to be pretty sharp with your eyes to see a sparrow. Actually, they uh, their hunting technique is uh, smash and grab. They uh, they fly incredibly quickly along hedgerows, just waiting to 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 catch a small bird that that bursts from cover. And uh, sparrowhawks are doing they do pretty well in South Devon, and uh, always a pleasure to see. You never really get a good view of them though. Uh, they're quite nervous birds if they're on if if they're uh, if they're perched anywhere uh, and in flight they can be very very quick, but maybe on a on a good bright uh, blue sky day they will soar a little. They'll find a thermal and uh, and get a bit of height. Just in the middle of the picture at the bottom is the osprey. That's a real prize for people to see. And uh, there have been a few ospreys uh, on our estuaries in recent weeks. Uh, once again, these are uh, birds from the north that are heading south. Um, but because you know they find a site with uh, you know with good fish stocks, uh, they'll stay and feed up before they head off on their long journeys. And and bottom left, probably the most resident of uh, uh, of these birds is the peregrine. And uh, peregrine falcons, although they uh, they breed on secret sites across our uh, cliff cliff coasts, um, but this time of year they might move move inland to the estuaries or some of the farmland areas to uh, to do their death defying dives to catch birds. Uh, the fastest bird in the UK, really, and uh, a real stunner to uh, to see when you see them. Uh, Although if you do see a big brown bird, it might even be a short-eared owl. Uh, there's been a few short-eared owls reported recently. Uh, these are migrant birds, once again, that uh, will uh, quarter. Uh, you know, one of those unusual spaces like Start Point. Uh, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be shocking to see one there. Um, I've, I've not seen one down here myself, actually. Uh, I've seen them on Exminster Marshes recently. But not in the not in the AOMB. But that's that's been one of the sad things about the uh, about the lockdown. Really, not being able to get out there as much as uh, as I could, um, and just spending my leisure time bird watching. But there we go. Perhaps that's the way it should be. So uh, here they are, uh, twitchers. You've probably all heard about twitchers. Um, they're a strange breed. Uh, I used to be one. 
Uh, I'm not really anymore. Uh, these are bird watchers that will travel the length and breadth of the country to see rare birds. There's been a total of uh, 574 species ever seen in the UK, ever recorded. Um, I've seen about 493 species of those, um, but I don't dash around the country anymore looking for rarities, but occasionally it happens here. There were quite a lot of bird watchers went to see and look for the, uh, the red-eyed vireo that I mentioned. And uh, these, these people, um, you know, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll look on, on various websites uh, to find out where the birds are. Um, everybody's very excited about a two-barred greenish warbler in, at Spurn Point uh, last couple of days. Uh, only, I think it's only the second or third time that there's ever been one here. I saw the first one on the Sillies back in the day. But um, yeah, these are, this is the time that birders get really excited and uh, dash around. Um, it's, it's sometimes mistakenly seen as a bird. This is a hummingbird hawk moth. Um, uh, hummingbirds probably couldn't actually uh, make it across the Atlantic. Hummingbirds are new world species. They only live in, uh, in North and South America. Um, there's none in Asia, there's none in the old world, as they say. Uh, and it's very unlikely that a hummingbird would be able to sustain itself, even if it was caught in a, a really, really strong Gulf Stream uh, wind. But every year, somebody will, uh, somebody will see one in their garden and say they've seen a hummingbird. Uh, it, it, this is it, it's the hummingbird hawk moth. Great species. Um, and I, I, I just like the fact that, uh, you know, the, the two, there are sort of, they've got a, a wingspan of about two inches, 60 millimeters, and uh, uh, they actually do seem quite bird like, and their wings hum as well. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a pleasure to see one if you, if you see one in the autumn. Um, here's some screen grabs. Uh, this was from yesterday. Um, Devon Birds have a great website. They have a latest bird sighting uh, section. Um, so just having a look here. Uh, Sean Pryor, uh, a red-breasted flycatcher. Once again, this is one of those birds that's at the top right there. The RBF, red-breasted flycatcher. Uh, from uh, from Eastern Europe, a couple of uh, have blown over. It's a good rare bird, rare bird really. Uh, so there was one of those uh, yesterday, just outside our patch. Actually, within our patch, there was uh, a black red star at East Charlton, um, and you can see that's the bird on the bottom right there. Um, some sometimes uh, it's the scientific study of birds that uh, that some people are interested in. And there's a there's a, a Mediterranean gull at Slapton yesterday. Somebody had got a, a very long telephoto lens and had photographed the uh, the ring on the bird's leg and found out that it it, it looks like it was uh, it had been ringed in Poland. So there we go. Um, this is just happening just as I speak, really. All of these birds moving. It's a it's a daily change round of birds at the moment. Um, and really unusual things as well. So uh, earlier in the month, uh, there was a bearded tit seen at, uh, at Berry Head, a bird that you really wouldn't expect at all to be in any sort of a habitat like uh, like the, the scrub at Berry Head. And uh, this could well be a, uh, a bird from the Netherlands that's... Uh, because once again, you sometimes get these eruption birds and bearded tits do sometimes move out and, uh, and move west. Fascinating stuff. Um, uh, this is, this is a, a, a desert wheat ear. This is a, uh, a bird that uh, essentially uh, should be in Africa, uh, living in the desert. Uh, it, came, it came to spend a whole winter with us at Thirlstone. And uh, that was a pleasure to see. And so these windblown migrating birds, uh, if they can find somewhere that sustains them, they'll stay. Here's another one of those real specialities. Uh, this is an Isabelline shrike. 
Uh, this is a bird that's usually found around the Caspian Sea and north and central China. Uh, but I took this photograph of, uh, of one on Thurlstone Golf Course, believe it or not. That's the wonder of, uh, of bird watching, really. Um, but I think it's uh, I think it's fair to say that on the whole, it's the common birds that uh, we're attracted to. Uh, it, it, it's only really the twitchers that dash around seeing these unusually plumaged species. Um, this is a bit of a, a, an interesting record as well. Uh, the rose coloured starling uh, at the top there. I took this photograph uh, last week. Uh, in Paynton, of all places. Uh, there it is, amongst a line of starlings. There's a, a bit of a blown up version of it as it was catching uh, catching wasps uh, and, uh, and, and other insects from the, the overhead wires. And that was seen today. So it's still there on the wires at Furnicum Road. Uh, this is a bird that uh, lives in, in Central Europe. And uh, this youngster's got lost along the way found itself with uh, a whole bunch of starlings just there in Paynton. So really, as I was saying, anything can happen at this time of year, really exciting. But uh, try to keep your feet on the ground. Um, you need to look at our website. Um, Nikki's done a huge amount of work working on the walks uh, that uh, you can follow. Uh, within the South Devon A and B, and our website's got some uh, got some great suggestions, and we've got all sorts of ways that you can connect with us on social media. You can uh, you can join our Facebook site and tell us what you've seen. Um, you can you can catch some news on Twitter as well. A lot of it's not about birds. A lot of it's about uh, unusual happenings or exciting things that are happening with policy and legislation. Um, you can find out all sorts from uh, from our social media uh, platforms there. So, like I say, uh, the walks page is interactive. Uh, when you click on these uh, these various walkers, you get um, all sorts of information about uh, the walks themselves. They're downloadable. They've got uh, audio trails as well. Um, and uh, there'll be a little, a little sort of vocal description of the walk as well. So you can feel a bit more confident about, uh, about getting out there. And the thing is, you don't have to take binoculars, but if you've got them, they're really worth having. Uh, seeing birds with your naked eye, it, it, you will see birds, but you won't get good views of them. Um, so I do urge you to get some binoculars. Uh, there's plenty on the market nowadays. You can get them relatively relatively cheap, or you can go sky's the limit and, uh, and spend a fortune on, on your optics. Um, same goes for telescopes, but it's just kit, isn't it? It's difficult carrying it all around with you. So uh, just going for a walk uh, in the different habitats across the AOMB will, uh, will, will, will get you in touch with, uh, with a lot of species. So um, that's where we are, very easy to find. Uh, have a look at Devon Birds. Uh, they've got a really good bird watching site, uh, or specifically uh, about about Devon itself. But you know, essentially, while you're out walking, talk to people that have got binoculars. On the whole, birders are really friendly people. People that are out on the coast path or out walking, um, you know, very very happy to uh, explain uh, what they've seen and. Um, uh, well, and, and, and essentially, uh, very, very encouraging. So that's essentially what I was going to speak about tonight. Uh, have I gone over time at all, Nikki? Yes, sure. you have, but don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, surprise, I thought, I, I thought I'd been extra quick tonight. No, you've got a lot to say as usual. I think it's fine. Um, I'm going to 